Hey, Christian. Morning, Doug. How's it going? Uh, pretty good. Bit of a That's... headache today, but yeah, I'm doing all right. Hopefully just a headache and not like a, <laughs> the onset of the coronavirus. Right. <laughs> uh... Anyway, I'll be flying the wall today. Okay. Sounds good. We'll be on mute until I start. Until yep. it starts up. Okay. Glad. Glad are you there? Oh, hey, hey, hello. Hmm. Okay, thanks for the warning. Hi, Eric. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good, and yourself? Pretty good. Yep, thank you. And uh, Clemens. Hello. Hello, you sound cheery today. <laughs> I am, because now everybody at Microsoft is also working remotely. <laughs> yeah, I, I've noticed and, that. And now I'll feel, the all new, all feel my pain, and that's a wonderful thing. Yes, I, I've had many conversations with companies who tend to run, or run, own, be in control of what you want to call it, particular open source projects, and they're all located in one particular area. And I keep telling them, have everybody work from home for a while and, and experience what it's like to not be in the inner circle or be hanging around the water cooler to be able to have those those chats and hear what's going on. It's, it's not fun. So I understand yeah, so your pain. I hope I, so as, as grave as the situation is certainly up there in the Pacific Northwest, 
uh, as happy I am of the, 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 the consequences of, of them now being in quarantine effectively at home. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Christian. I'm Christoph, sorry. Hi. Hello. Yeah, but your prediction was right, though. You, you kind of, last week, I think you kind of predicted that uh, they were going to cancel. So there you go. Yep. Hmm. Well, it's postponed, but, you know, to keep going to you in July, August, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Because by now, everybody will have book vacation. And unless, you know, if, if, if people go on vacation, then they would go to a conf like, like those two things will always be in conflict. Yep. Yep. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. Uh, hey, Mike. Good morning. Morning. And Heinz. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hello. And Klaus. Yes. Hello. Hello. Did I get everybody? Ginger. Good morning. Good morning, Doug. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. All right. Everybody's nice and early today. It actually might be a short call because short agenda, just a couple of PRs review. Actually, while you guys are waiting, since we usually don't start till three after, um, if you guys want to take a look at the, in particular, the first PR in the list, the sending and coding of Kafka headers, um, to see what you guys think in there, because there was a must that was added there. And I don't think it's a big deal, because I think that was the intent all along. But I wouldn't mind getting some feedback from people who have touched the Kafka stuff in the past. Hmm. Morning, Doug. This is Colin. Oh, hey, Colin. Welcome. All right, uh, Pranay, are you there? Yeah. Hello. Is this your first time on the call? I apologize if it's not. Yeah, it's my first time. Okay. Can you do me a favor? And um, here, let me paste a link in the chat. Here's a link to the meeting notes. Either put your company name next to your name in the meeting notes, or just type into the chat and I'll add it for you. Just want to make sure I get you associated with the right company, assuming you want to be associated with the company. And then, uh, Vinay, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I apologize for you too. Is this your first time in? I can't no, remember. No, this is my second time. Okay, then I should already have you. Never mind then. Good. No worries, but thank you. You almost got my spelling right. It's actually B A N. Oh, so close. No, no, B E N K. I'm sorry. I can I can fix it. No worries. It's okay. I can do that. I got a whole. Thank you. I have a whole minute before the meeting starts, so I have time. All right, Mr. Jeff, are you there? Jeff yeah, on? Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Let's see. Did I miss anybody? Who is N-G-I-R-A-L-D-O? I don't know if that's a full name or if it's a combination of two names squished into one. Uh, hello, yes, that's Nick Lopez Geraldo. I'm a new member. Oh, cool, can you do me a favor? And in the WebEx, I'm sorry, in the Zoom chat, can you just put your full spelling of your last name and the company you're with, just so I can get it right for the attendance? Yes. Cool, thank you, appreciate that. 
All right, and it's three after, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, but I'm bum, bum, bum. got a question for you guys. So a long time ago, when we were talking about a new icon for cloud events, I believe Austin took an action item to change the tagline on the on the sticker and on the icon. I honestly can't remember why people didn't like it, but I figure it's been there long enough. No one's complained about it. Does anybody have any problem with just closing out this AI? I can't imagine it really matters that much at this point. Any objection? Okay, not hearing any. I'll just close that one out. Just trying to clean up the backlog. All right, community time. Any questions from the community for about topics that are not on the agenda? All right, moving on then. So KubeCon, in case you have not heard, um, it has been postponed until June and July. Um, so we don't need to worry about the planning at this point in time. So it gives us a break for presentation creation and stuff like that. Um, as things, oh, and that does include these, the day zero events like the Serverless Practitioner Summit as well. Um, if anything does pop up, I'll, I'll try to remember to mention it to you guys, but obviously you'll probably get the emails just the same as me. Um, all right, SDK. Jeff, Doug, I, I do have oh, one yeah. update there. I, uh, if anybody like me unregistered because your company uh, prohibited international travel, um, they cannot re-register from you from that. You will have to go in and register again. Ooh, thank you for that information. I, was, I did wonder about that. That's interesting. Okay, thank you, Mike. I guess I should ask anybody else have any other information about KubeCon that people might want to know about? All right, cool. Um, SDK call, I can't, I think it may have had a call last week, but it was relatively short. We do have another call planned for today, I believe because Scott had something he wanted to bring up today. Um, and also there is another PR that I just opened today that I wanted to, whoops, darn it, did that again. There's another PR just for the SDK folks to consider. It's down here on the list. Um, so I do want to bring that up today. So anyway, short version is we will have an SDK call right after this one. It will probably start early, just a warning for people. A uh, quick update for that. The yep. Golang SDK has, it, we, we've been working towards uh, two, version two. Uh, version two drops support for uh, cloud event spec V01 and O2. Okay, cool. Thank you, Scott. Any questions for Scott? Cool. All right. Thank you again, Scott. I, uh, Kathy is not on the call. Is there anybody else from the work? Workflow subgroup that want to mention that wants to mention anything. Okay, one thing I will mention is I know that they are in the process of putting together their proposal to go to the CNCF TOC to be proposed as a sandbox project. I believe there's a pull request in the um, in the TOC's GitHub repo. If you want to take a look at that, I don't think it'd be um, surprising to anybody in this group who's been kind of following what they're doing. But if you do have any comments, obviously please go over there and, and comment on it or comment on it in the uh, in the workflow Slack channel. They watch that as well. Okay. All right, let's get to the fun stuff. Discovery APIs. Um, so Mike, you're up first. Do you want to look at the Google Doc or do you want to look at your PR? I think that the PR is more up to date at this point. Okay, there you go. Anything in particular you want me to scroll to or just talk to it? Um, so, yeah, so I, I, in trying to like actually put this together and rationalize about it, um, there was one thing in particular that stuck out is the like the grouping and the fan out. Um, so the the problem the problem is I don't know if problem is the right word, but if you look at the way source is defined in the cloud event spec, um, source can be a pretty highly variable thing depending on the the events provider. Uh, so it seems like it would be fairly common or say a blob storage provider to have each directory or bucket available as a separate source. Um, so I, I bumped that up to an array in the return. Um, you probably scroll down a bit and see, but yeah, let's look at the structure of, um, yeah. So I added a producer as a first order thing, which would be a human readable string. Um, the idea here is thinking about UX around discovery uh, you can imagine somebody building a CLI or a UI where um, if you look at some of the notes from, from the, the Google Doc from several weeks ago, I talked about this idea of a discovery funnel. So how do users actually come in uh, and discover events? Um, and I think there are sort of like two avenues we think about is one is like, I know what type of event I want to discover, maybe because somebody told me directly, or I know the service from which I want to discover events. 
uh, and being able to first narrow in by the producer. Uh, and then for each type that they produce, uh, collapsing down to a, uh, an array of, of sources, um, this allows a provider to sort of pre-populate this. Um, I'm happy, like, I'm happy, I don't know if people are familiar with the Google Cloud Functions um, UI, uh, but it has a really nice uh, flow here where it's, you know, I pick what service I want. So I pick, I want to be triggered by Google Cloud PubSub and then I get a drop down for all of the topics that I could be triggered by. Uh, and that allows that to be dependent on who's logged in. So what am I, what resources am I allowed to see? What could I subscribe to? Um, so that's sort of the, the biggest change I think in here and, and perhaps something that'll be controversial, perhaps not. Um, the new OpenShift UI is super slick on this regard. It does the same thing, but kind of in a graph format and it's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> okay, is there any place else you want me to scroll to or do you, do you want to highlight, Mike? Oh, well, Ryan's hand is up, sorry. One, um, one other yeah. thing I kind of can't, oh, let's go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, sorry, um, oh, remind me, what was this before? Was this just uh, a string? Um, the source? Yes. Yeah, so it was just a string. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, another thing that came up when we did an internal you know, Google review on this yesterday is the concept of also having source as one of the query parameters, the usefulness of that, Be because of this way it's used in the return. Any other questions, comments? I suspect most people obviously need time to look it over. Yeah. One thing that might that I, that I think would be useful is if you showed a sample output from the queries. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's on my, I think I just got it to do at the bottom. Or no, I took that out because it didn't, it, it Travis CI failed. Because um, oh. uh, I had an un, uh, undone uh, example. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that in. Uh, I kind of wanted to see if anybody had like violent reactions to this before I started constructing examples. Violent. Clemens, did you want to say something? You came up with there, or are you just preparing yourself? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't okay. have my... No. <laughs> Any other questions for Mike? Okay, seems to me it's heading in the, in the, in the right direction, so that's all goodness. Um, but I, to be honest, I haven't had a chance, to, I only had a chance to look at it this morning, so. For not, for not having much time to look at it, you had a lot of comments. I apologize. <laughs> 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 Most of them I think are relatively minor, but it, that, that last one I did, I just, I'm, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around it, but it, like I said, did, you know, it, it well, could all be me. Did what I say about source make sense there? Kind of, I, I think I'm still stuck in this mental model of, I feel like there's like a, a list of static, there's like a static query and then there's a more dynamic query. And I, I, I have this mental model in my head and I, and I can't figure out whether I'm right and I need to convince you of it or I'm just flat out wrong and you need to convince me of it. I don't know. Okay. So yeah, sor source I think is the more dynamic thing. So like yeah. the provider and event types is more static. Um, the one thing I, I kind of went back and forth on is like, should, should we have two query options? One, which is basically give me the static thing, don't expand the sources versus give me that dynamic thing, do expand the sources. What about subject? Because it seems like uh, this example, TN1222 slash uh, alerts, that should be the subject and sensors is the, the source. Uh, I don't disagree with you, Scott, but that's not how source is defined in the spec currently, in the, in the CE spec. So I was trying to lean into that. I, I, think, I think it is. I think there's examples of both. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think we need to have the flexibility to allow both. Interesting. The subject is optional, but in the, the intention of it when it was introduced was to do things like you just showed, to be able to fuzzy match on subject where source is static. It's interesting that you don't have subject in your list here, do you, or am I missing it? Um, we did that in the doc. I had proposed striking that. So Scott, are you suggesting that 
subjects should be part of the list of attributes? I, I think so, because there are sources where, like, if you if you wrote a GitHub one, for example, you could have the the org and repo be the source and the subject be like the, a specific pull request. Right. So in that case, like this is simple. So if you look at one of the other things I added, this source, uh, what did I call it? If you scroll down a little bit, Doug, this, I think it's the next attribute. Yeah, this source structure. Would something like a subject structure help there? Like help help you how to interpret what's in the subject field? This is an old argument, but I, I feel like we we need to go back to there needs to <laughs> needs to be some sort of like way to assemble the source and the subject into a, a single identifier like you're showing here where you might have github.com organization repo is the source poll I, poll slash id is the subject you want to talk about a conical link to it and you, it's a, what are the pieces in each and how do you combine them to make a single uh discoverable resource well i, I would uh, so like, I, when you talk about specific pool IDs, that wouldn't be part of discovery because those aren't known in advance. But, I, I know, but the fuzzy matches, the, like what the shape will be is known. So it's a like, scenario I, that I can imagine where, you, where source matters. In, so first of all, I think what we define as a source is the, the, or, the origin of, of, of the event. And then the 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 subject really de describes something that is inside of that origin of the event. But if you are describing a discovery API, then you're mostly only describing the origin and where you know the associated um, um, and you're really describing the associated subscription manager effectively, where you can go and get that event from. Now, subject may mat may matter still if you have some kind of a partitioning scheme where um, you have some sort of, of, of events um, are coming from this subscription manager and some events are coming from the other subscription manager, but they all are um, describing effectively the same overarching source. Exactly, because the, the, the root source so it's, would continue to be github.com organization repo, but then the list of subjects could be poll ID issue ID, comment ID. Yeah, exactly. But so those would be, I think, uh, different entries in the, like different discovery uh, docs, we call it, like each, each different entities because uh, pivoting on the type for those. Well, that's, that's true. But from a, from a, from a, uh, so yes, they would be different entries. And every, if we're referring then to subscription, to, to subscription manager endpoints, um, those would also like likely point to different subscription manager endpoints. But if you query for them, they will all be from one source. That is the organi organization raising events. Um, but they might be, and we're just obviously just you know speculating here. And GitHub may be not the best example for it. But they are from a from a particular from from a, a greater source, a, a greater context. And then you would still query for. Um, the subject um, as a further discriminator. So you can. So, this, this is the thing I'm struggling with is the like, could you actually include, like, would you actually expand and materialize the various subjects in discovery? Um, because I don't, I, I don't think they exist up front. I don't think, I don't think you want to. No, I, so, so like, so that's why I asked the question about is something like, defining the subject structure in the way the source structure I have here, does that make more sense than having the raw subjects? If at all, I would, I would, I would generally, I would generally not make things so complicated and would just go and work with, with suffix prefix first. So Christoph's hand is up. Christoph, you want to ask a question? Yeah. So maybe it's, I, I didn't get this right, but from my understanding or, or we discussed it, so I think when we have this GitHub thing, we have the organization, we have the repo, we have the pull request. And then my understanding was that we put basically including the PR, the pull request itself into the source, and then only the ID of 
the pull request itself, the particular pull request, there into the subject? Or, or am I wrong? So, oh, yeah, yeah. That, if, if, yeah, yeah, that's right. Because then I can do the discovery on that part. Because otherwise, it's completely unclear where the boundary is. Because if you have like a tree structure, it's a bit random at what point in the tree you set the boundary between subject and source. I, I just from a platform perspective, I can see there being a need for quarter cases like partitioning to do some pre-filtering, also to do some pre-filtering on the subject. But I think I think that's really that is a corner case. That like the 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 ninety five percent case should be you only look for source you, and you ignore the subject in in the uh, on the discovery registration side. Does that help you, any Mike? I I, would, I, mean, I think. We needed to, to distinguish between the discovery and the registration. I totally see filtering on subject being part of the subscription side. I want to make sure that we have the right information in discovery so that I know how to make that subscription. I think GitHub is probably a poor example for that because like we talk, here we talk about subject as being IDs of things, which again are not known in advance, but like if you think about like a blob storage, uh, kind of thing, a star.jpg subject filter makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Like, we understand the what the bucket name is, but we don't know what, what's in that bucket. So it seems like we're kind of f falling into a pattern where subject tends to be undiscoverable at run, uh, at, at install time and only at runtime. Ryan, your hands up. Yeah, I just wonder, is this a, just a question of how ephemeral um, these objects that we're hanging off of are? Um, so like there's there's lots of examples within Twilio that can fall in either bucket, right? So for example, an SMS message that's sent through Twilio or any other provider um, is uh, ephemeral in terms of the life cycle of when it's active, right? And And so if you wanted to subscribe to the events from a particular SMS message, um, it's going to be really hard to discover because it happened so quickly. Um, but a, um, I don't know, a, an, an account level of event, such as like a user logging in or uh, the account uh, metadata changing, whatever it is, that's you know, more persistent and long lived. So I, I just wonder like, if we're trying to define um, this in terms of how ephemeral it is. I think it's a really interesting point. Um, the, the the question I would ask is like, in, is there a user scenario for subscribing to events for a single SMS message, or would I be subscribing to all SMS in this region or for this phone number in this in that case? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a, it is something that we do support today um, because you can the way that we do this today is is through webhooks. You, when you okay. um, make a REST API call through the API, uh, you can specify a status callback, which is basically analogous to um, how we're talking about cloud events um, uh, that is completely informational. Um, and you can do that on a per message basis. Um, uh, so, so it's definitely something that is done today. Um, whether uh, you know that is a minority use case or a majority use case, I can't speak to. Okay, uh, Klaus, your hand is up. Um, yes. So maybe another example. So in, in our products, usually a subject is uh, what we call a business object. So um, sales order or maybe a customer, billing document, you name it. And we have different ways to, to identify those objects and they might also exist. The same object might exist in multiple uh, services or systems. And um, so for subject, something like a uh, description which uh, a kind of identifier is used as subject for that event would be uh, helpful, for example. Not the specific value, but just what kind of identifier scheme is used. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Mike, anything else you wanted to 
bring up? Obviously, the next step here is that people keep looking at the PR and commenting like crazy. Yeah, thanks everyone for the for those examples and input. A um, couple of cases I hadn't considered. Uh, I, I it sounds like there's a little potentially some consensus about not trying to expand subjects in discovery. Yep. Okay. W would it make sense to add that, like, here's how you take a, an event payload and con con uh, convert it into a resource URL? using the source and subject combo. Like this, this is one of the things I've struggled with on what what do you do with those things to get to the actual resource? Isn't that going to be provider dependent? Well, like how, is, how, how, how prescriptive do we want to be about that? Well, this is a discovery API, right? Oh, for discovery, I see. Yep, yep. How do you discover how to go and access the thing you just got? Well, yeah, but I don't want to make assumptions that it's always an assembly of source and subject to get to the thing you just got, because we do have data ref, we do have the ability to pass data and attributes in the event itself. It's mm -hmm. not like it's not always a go back to the producer to ask for a specific resource kind of scenario. Yeah, yeah. The, the cloud event spec doesn't help in this this part like once you do get the the pull request event if it's split up into github org repo poll and then there's an id that you can't really like show a link to that thing uh, deterministically you can't but like that could be part of the data payload of the event itself if if the provider really cared to send that information across that's, that's true Okay, anything else? All right, cool, thank you, Mike. Yep. And let's go back to the stock. I assume Clemens, let me scroll down to your section. Yeah, we we have started to do the, uh, or, or I have started, we, we, had, a, we had a call and it's, uh, mostly what we decided was to uh, um, also start doing that document. I've done, uh, a bunch of work on the first three pages of that, restructuring some of the the um, uh, terminology. So this is now outdated effectively, uh, but we haven't shared the document yet because we wanted to um, to review that in the group first and then share. So we're going to do that next week. Um, uh, but I found, uh, hopefully for, for Heinz, I found a palatable replacement for push and pull. <laughs> We're still going to call. We're still going to use the terminology pull style and push style, but we're going to augment that with uh, uh, some some extra um, uh, explanation. Um, and that is you know, who's initiating the the delivery. And once that's the consumer initiating it, and once that's the subscription manager initiating that, and so that's going to be um, uh, hopefully helping to clarify this. Um, and so, but the subscription spec, the, the part of the subscription documents uh, ended up being much longer than I thought. So this is about me not being able to you know, get the homework done between Tuesday and today. And I'm sorry about that. Okay, I think this filter dialect section might be relatively new, isn't it? Yeah, the filter dialect section is new. That's right. Anything you want to comment on that one or just point uh, to we'll, it? We'll discuss that. We'll discuss it when, we're, when we have the document okay. uh, transposed. Okay. Any other <clears throat> or any comments or questions for Clemens? Nothing? Okay, in that case, thank you Clemens and everybody else in the group. I'm looking forward to the PR. I get one, one, one question for people. Um, let me just double check here. So Mike, you created it <clears throat> as a top level document, which obviously makes sense as of right now. Um, at some point, as long as we keep these specs in the same repo, we are probably going to want to think about restructuring the repo itself to have directories and stuff. Um, just wanted to check with people, do you, does everybody still think that as of right now we should keep it in the same repo or should we start thinking about a separate repo for these other specs? If we're going to put them out to a different repo, I wouldn't want to restructure then unrestructure. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Just popped up I, in my head I like today. all in one place. 
I tend to as well, but I want to make sure no one had any second thoughts. Yeah, I, I think all in one place. I, I figured if you wanted me to put this in a directory, that was an easy change later. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, I'll, I'll go off and think about possible restructure of everything, and then we can figure out where you guys' stuff go later. <laughs> okay. In that case, uh, last chance. Any questions, comments about the overall doc, whether it's Clement's section or just everything in general? All right, cool, thank you. In that case, let's go to PRs. Okay, so there was a question about, let's see if I can even remember this thing. Hold on a sec. Here's the original issue. It was a question about um, binary mode and the attributes in Kafka <clears throat> and whether they're strings or not. I'll let you guys read that for in a sec or take a second to read that. And here's the PR for it. Give you guys a second to look at that. The one part that worries me is that, as well as the other one down here. So I know I'm starting to come up to speed, but I feel like I still know next to nothing about Kafka, so I'm gonna I need to count on you guys. But this seemed okay to me. But for anybody who actually played with Kafka a lot, do you guys have any opinion on this? Is this something that we need actually that we need to actually specify, or was it okay before? Clemens, yeah, you want you were coming off mute. I believe I believe that uh, um, that is for for most usage for most for for most usage that's a no op because um, you're typically going to be using some SDK and the SDK does that already, so the Kafka SDK. Um, but I think that is correct. Um, I'll be happy to go and take a take a look at that too, uh, as the as the reviewer and um, uh, go and cross check that against the the protocol spec. But I think that's right. Okay, I appreciate that because, like I said, I think the must is consistent with what we intended, and that's why it's not a normative. It's not really a normative change, even though technically it is because adding a must is a is a breaking yeah, I change. I think that's a that's a that is mostly a clarification because um, otherwise things will not work because. Right. Uh, the the wire protocol requires it to be UTFA. I'll I'll go and verify that and, and make a note in the comments. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and if, go ahead. If I can, if I can add something, uh, in looking at the Kafka message specification itself, uh, the headers are it's a map of byte array key and byte array value. So technically. In the uh, in, in the protocol itself, it's it's a byte array. That's why that's why I think we need a clarification. Yeah, my, and my concern was just that 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 was the intention the entire time. We just forgot to add that text. Yeah. So the I think the question is is what is the what is the if you are putting a um, a header in using the regular Kafka. JVM client, does that store it as UTFA? And I, I, well, I think that it does. Uh, I, if I recall correctly, the when you set the header, you uh, the headers inside the JVM client are represented as a list, yeah, and not as a map, and the list as a record header. I think it's the name of the object, and it's a key byte array and value byte array. So oh, it's just spider rays. Yeah, I think. I, maybe I should check, but if I recall correctly, that's how it works. And, okay. and, and for example, uh, this, this basically uh, came out when I was implementing the Kafka binding for the Cloud Events Go SDK. So, mm -hmm. because, because the Sarama, for, which is the client, the Kafka client for Go, uh, gives you uh, an, array, uh, an array with, uh, with uh, uh, key, uh, byte array key and byte array, and byte array value. So. Um, uh -huh. 
What, what, um, but you did the implementation for Go already? Yes. So what did you did you did you do the the UTF-8 mapping mapping then? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, so I, again, I'm I'm leaning towards that being right because that's that's the 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 best the best in quotes uh, um, uh, you know mapping from strings to a byte array. Um, so I'm, I have no objection to having that that rule, and I don't think if we add this, it's going to break anything. Yeah, it also follows what it's already done in the. Um, uh, what's the name in the, in the cloud events Java clients. <clears throat> okay. Well, then, then, then that's probably what we should do. Yeah. So I'm, I have no objection. Sorry, I was on mute. Let's give everybody a week to think about it. Um, Cause I don't want to rush it. Um, and in the must is the thing that worries me. So I want everybody to take a look at it or if you know about the stuff, take a look at it. And if you have any concerns, comment before next week's call. Sound fair? All right, thank you, everybody. Um, all right, this PR is mine. I can't remember exactly where it was, but somewhere somebody had a question about how to discover whether an incoming message is actually a cloud event. And obviously when it is a structured cloud event, it's easy because the MIME type tells you that or the content type header tells you that. However, it wasn't clear what to do if it's a binary message. I mean, how do you know whether it's a cloud event then? And the spec never actually says. Um, so what I thought about doing was adding some text along these lines here, which basically says if it's binary and the four required headers are present, then it's a cloud event. Now that you can't be 100% guaranteed of that because we can't stop somebody from just randomly using our headers, but not claiming that they're a compliant cloud event spec. For some reason, they just could be borrowing ours. Um, so with that of our domain to actually mandate something like, you know, don't use our headers unless you're a cloud event spec. We can't say that. Um, so that's why I say things like it would be reasonable for a receiver to assume that. I think that's the best kind of guidance we can provide. Um, so if you guys take a, get a chance, please take a look at this. See if the text sounds right. Or if you don't like the entire idea at all, obviously say that as well. But if you're okay with this general direction for the text, then I'll make similar changes to the other protocols but I wanted to start with uh, the HTTP one to see how people thought about it in general. Okay, and um, Francesco, to your question, um, I'm gonna take, maybe I need to clarify this. When I say mandatory fields, I'm talking about the mandatory cloud event attributes. So there, and there's four of them, spec version, uh, what is it, source type, um, and one other one, I can't remember what it was. Those are, the, those are what I mean by required. Any questions on this one? Yes, that's that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry. I, I wanted. Yeah, I I have no problem. Yeah, I mean, in general, does 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 this direction kind of sound right to people? That's what the SDK or the Go SDK does. It says check the mime type or check the media type. If that's something that is not uh, special, then check the if there's a version. And if there's a version, then try to start to parsing it. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I, it's funny. Originally, um, the text in here only talked about the spec version field. And then uh, I couldn't sleep last night, so I started thinking about this for some odd reason. And I realized that technically, it shouldn't just be that one field. It actually should be all four, since they're all required fields. And that way, you can say, well, if you don't have all four and you only have three of them, well, then you're not compliant to the spec. Therefore, you're not a cloud event. And that, that was my original thinking. But if you guys, for some reason, think, you know, spec version alone should be sufficient, uh, you know, speak up at some point. Uh, the, the problem with requiring goal for all the four mandatory fields, so all mandatory attributes, is that uh, how do you distinguish between a malformed cloud event and a non-cloud event? Because um, I think what the Go SDK would do is it would it would give you an event, but if you tried to validate that event, it would say it was nil if it finds a version. Yes, that's yes, that's how it works in uh, SDK Go. It uh, and the, uh, but in uh, in SDK Go, the distinction is done just on the spec version field. 
uh, on the spec version attribute, not on the others. Right, but for, I think from a spec perspective, if you don't have all four, it's not a valid cloud event. Yeah, sorry, uh, to be clarify, the, the parsing requires just the version. The validity of the event requires the mandatory fields. Right. So, 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 so Scott, do you think the text in here is, is correct from a spec perspective to say you have to have all four for it to even be thought of as a cloud event? I think to do just parsing, you need to inspect content type and look for version. Version tells you how to parse the rest. It, I think parsing is different than, is it a valid event? Right. That's what I was trying to get to. Right. Okay. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm always open to, the word, to wording changes. So if you think the wording here needs to change, let me know. But it doesn't sound like anybody disagrees with the general direction. It's more a question of four versus one attribute and maybe some wording. But you, know, you don't have to think about it right now on the call. Okay. Okay. But yeah, um, if you do think you have some, you're going to have some comments on there, I would appreciate comments sooner rather than later because, as I said, I would like to make similar changes to the other uh, transport specs. I thought about possibly putting this into the main spec itself, but I thought um, the text might be different or might be uh, transport specific. That's why I stuck it in here. But if you guys think it might be better suited in the main spec itself, I can try to fit it in there somehow. I just couldn't think of the right wording. So anyway, think about it. Okay. Any, you go ahead, Scott. This is exactly why the GoLang SDK is dropping support for dot one and dot two because we kind of flip-flopped on the name of the version. So parsing the, the incoming request was difficult. Ah, good point. Thank you. Okay, moving forward then. Um, this one, I'm trying to remember why I just take this in the agenda. Um, I think I stuck this one here because I wasn't sure what what's happening with it. Does anybody remember? I, Klaus, you were, and Klaus and Scott, you guys were talking on this one. Do you remember what the resolution of this one was? Let me refresh your memory. It's this one. I, I thought we decided that it was the example is an invalid cloud event. The example that he provided here, you mean? Um, or do you mean an example in the spec? Or oh, actually, that is from the spec. The, oh, 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 oh. Yes, I was wrong. <laughs> Um, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, do we need to change the spec at all, or do you think that the issue itself is is invalid? I seem to have the vague recollection that, that we were saying that his, his, his interpretation of the spec was wrong, but I can't remember for sure. I, 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 I would, sorry, I need to look at the issue. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Klaus, anything you want, you want to say? I think it was related to the changes we did um, only shortly before 1.0 um, regarding the content type, the data content type. So that if you're using a structured encoding, then um, you have the default, like here for the uh, application uh, JSON. Um, if, so if you use a JSON encoding and you, do don't, you don't have to specify it and it's assumed that data is a JSON value. And, so I think it mainly was a misunderstanding around this. But. Yeah, I think that's right. The, the end result is that the, these are both a valid examples, but they're not equivalent because the middle example there, the, the, it's a string of serialized JSON object as a JSON string. Mm -hmm. The third example is foo bar object as a JSON object. Mm -hmm. So they, they have the same data, but they're not equivalent. Right. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like we're saying this issue should probably be closed. I'll figure out some way to, to let them down easy. Okay. Thank you guys. Uh, last item on the agenda, Francesco, I think you just added this one. Did you want to talk to this one? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's just uh, maybe some bad wording, uh, which I found while I was implementing the Kafka specification is that inside the Kafka binding specification, it states that there should be a K extension. While then I open the link of the partitioning extension specification and the name is, and the name of the extension is 
partition here. So that's that's not clear. That just, be out of, just out of curiosity, assuming it is just a simple typo kind of thing, which one should it be? Just key or partition key? Partition key is clear. Okay. Anybody else disagree with that? Hi, sorry, it's Jen. What are we agreeing or disagreeing on? Uh, we're saying, he's, uh, Francisco was saying that in the Kafka spec, we use the word, or we talk about ex an extension key, or an extension called key, uh, pointing to the partitioning extension spec. But in the partitioning extension spec, it's actually called partition key, not just key. So there's an inconsistency in the wording or the name of the uh, attribute. Oh, I see. Sorry. So probably that, that Kafka spec should just refer to the partitioning extension and not make any comment about the key. That would work too. Yes. Well, the, the, the words, um, if we can open the spec, uh, yep. okay. Yeah, the, this, this paragraph key attribute, oh. I mean, it, it was useful to, uh, when, when I was explain when I was implementing the, the spec. So I like this paragraph, but yeah, the name should be consistent. And it's actually this spot right here, right? Yeah, and the, and the one. Yeah. yeah, even in the name of the paragraph. Yeah, typo, I'd say. Yeah. Do huh. you want to submit a pull request to fix that? Yeah, I can do that. That'd be cool. Thank you. Okay, so maybe write on the issue that we agreed on partition key. Yeah. Uh, what is today? Whoops. Actually, it's not four, it's 23, isn't it? January, February, March, yeah. Oh, gosh. That's fine. Right. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments on this? All right, last one. Um, this is, I was going to bring this up in the SDK call. But if anybody has any questions on uh, or comments on this, I just want to bring it up quickly. Um, there was a question in the SDK.md file that talks about what we expect of SDKs. And it basically says, you know, support ongoing changes to cloud event spec. We obviously, you know, try to keep up to it. But somebody asked a question about what that actually means, right? Does it mean every single version, every single old version, release candidates, point releases, major releases, whatever? So I tried to make it clear that. Uh, it'd be nice if everybody supported at least the latest and N minus one major release. And then for each major release, um, uh, we're only gonna ask them to at least support the very latest point release. And that release candidates are not required, but strongly encouraged. We don't have to talk about that now. I was gonna save that for the SDK call, but if anybody on the main call has any questions or comments about that, I wanted to bring it to your attention to, to look it over. Okay. All right, in that case, at the end of the agenda, any other topics people want to bring up? All right, last call for attendance. Doug, are you there? Oh, there you are, Doug. Did I miss anybody else for attendance? All right, in that case, we are done. Thank you guys, we'll talk again next week and we'll start the SDK call in about two minutes. Thanks everybody. Thank you, goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. The SDK call, can we stay here? Right? Of course. Oh, you are. Let's, let's not talking to us. Yeah. <laughs> same, same, same uh, Slack or uh, same Zoom channel. So yeah, you don't have to move. Everybody else moves except us. <laughs>
All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Scott, you're first on the list. There's a list? Well, I had you on the agenda. Whoa, what did I do? I have you on the agenda, or did you already say everything you wanted to say about it? <laughs> uh, no, no, so uh, Sir Slinky and I are hacking away at <laughs> I like that. Sir, Sir Slinky, that's good. We're doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's awesome. So uh, basically, we're, we're looking at um, the, the work on bindings exposed a lot of performance improvements that can be done if you don't delegate all the way down to the conical event, which is something we want to promote in other projects. So we're going to rework the SDK to make it easy to be able to be an integrator at that level. So if you would like to be a function and consume events, it, it works for that. If you would like to be a uh, kind of middleware and receive uh, like half parsed message objects that aren't, they're, they're events internally, but they're not all the way exploded out, that's possible. And then you can, you know, forward it onto the next transport hop. So like doing uh, middleware fan out or uh, filtering and fan out. So you have access to the attributes. And then we're going to make it possible for um, somebody that, that would like to interact with uh, their transport or their protocol directly, so like uh, the AWS use case, and they just want access to be able to marshal the event in and out of uh, some JSON form. And that'll be possible. So we're, we're trying to service these kind of like three main users of this SDK. So it's pick the format in which you want to see the data. It's, it's basically you're um, in this sliding scale, you're giving up or taking over control over the protocol. Interesting. So at, at like a function consumer point, it, you don't really care how it got to you. You don't even care what protocol it came on. You just care that it's an event uh, at the, at the middleware level, you really care about optimizing the usage of the protocol so that you can do things like uh, understand how your partition keys in Kafka are and working. And, and we don't have to like plumb all that data through the SDK because it's too cumbersome. So the work here that uh, Sir Slinky and I are working on is like trying to make this easier so that there can be an optimized usage of the SDK or it gets out of your way and you can do all the things you do today, but still gives you the ability to take your event and push it onto the wire, but not drop the use case of like, make it super stupid easy, where it's mm -hmm. like two lines of code to send an event. Sounds good to me. I always like the option of keeping it simple at first and get having back doors to get to the more complicated stuff if you really need that level of control. Sounds cool. Yeah, so that's what's coming. Um, there's gonna be a lot of breaking API changes and we don't care. Uh, <laughs> we cut a 1.1. .1. I like this move. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, 1.1, .1, I made a branch. We can continue that fork um, of the code, but in two, it's gonna be a little more trimmed up. It's gonna have a slightly different usage case. The, the API is gonna be a little less uh, cringy because it, it got a little feature creeped. So yeah, that's that's what's going on. Cool. And you, this is just an FYI thing. You're not actually asking for input from the group or anything. This is just a let everybody know, right? Yeah, yeah, this is what's happening. If you would like to come hack and help, um, we're, we're working on that full time right now. Cool. Any questions for Scott or Sir Slinky? All right, cool, thank you. So I went back and looked at some of the uh, more recent old meetings to, to make sure I was, I pulled out some of the action items because I, I kept feeling like we were forgetting to do some. And I came across one that was assigned to me that said make sure we uh, documented the leads for each SDK, which conceptually sounds good so people know who to poke on if they have specific questions. However, before I, wanted, before I was gonna go off and do that, I wanted to double check and make sure that we really did wanna do that because do people really want to get pinged directly about stuff or do we want to just add text to each readme that says if you have a question about this don't hesitate to open up an issue that way it's not pointed at one particular person it's to the group itself i have a terrible idea oh, what's that 
what if we make up a list like a a work group list so you if you would like to directly contact the owners of this you send it to the like cncf working group sdk go or c sharp or python and in that list is the current owners and we can manage that list so how is that different than opening up an issue because once uh, you get an, once you get an email anyway have you seen my github <laughs> We get about 4,000 GitHub emails. Yeah, I know. We all do, but... Yeah, it's, that's, that's the biggest issue that you really can't see stuff. I see okay. noise from lists because they, they tend to be written by humans, but automation from GitHub is... I, I'm i sorry, but like, that, that is a broken tool. <laughs> yes. Okay, so... <clears throat> I've... I, um, I have a feeling I, I'm, I'm going to get some resistance about creating a, a, a mailing list per SDK. Um, one for all of SDKs, I could probably convince them of. But I don't know about one per SDK. Uh, I, I think one, one for SDKs is fine. Okay. If you want, I, okay. Let me, what, uh, what, before, I, before I head down that path, what do other people think? Do you want that? Do you want me to just put your names in there with emails? Right. Or do you want me to look into the one SDK mailing list? Personally, I think that each uh, each SDK probably has its, its community, so everybody can handle on its own. I mean, like for example, for Rust SDK, I could do a Git or Channel because maybe it's better. So we're trying to make a consistent method for all of the SDKs for people that, that are coming to the cloud events. Well, as soon as, as soon as the, the, the read, uh, the read me of the, of the repo clearly states where to get support, uh, with which people somebody should talk. I, I, I don't see the reason for having a mailing list for each SDK. But maybe, maybe SDK go, which is a, pretty good user base should have one, but maybe other SDK shouldn't have, I don't know. Yeah, this exactly, the, this action item started because we were, uh, we didn't know what SDK supported 1.0 and Doug had to contact everybody and he had no idea who to contact. <laughs> yeah, I did figure the it out. Is, the this SDK, the C Sharp SDK were very well handled and documented. The JavaScript SDK too, I think Fabio was working on that. Mm -hmm. And he was rather public in it, but the rest of them were a bit unmaintained or less maintained, to put it nicely. <laughs> well, <laughs> Python, 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 I was Python SDK is unmaintained too. Yeah, we, we need to get another volunteer for Python because I think it's a, a fairly desired language for cloud events. And uh, it's fallen by the wayside. Uh, the, the, the Java SDK, it's actively maintained or not? I think it's fairly active. Because I, I, I can volunteer to, to, work on, uh, to work on it. Go right ahead. <laughs> well, no, one's gonna, no one's gonna stop you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Can I break everything? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> well, I, I think you have to check with Fabio, right? Because Fabio owns that one. Yeah. Okay, so I can. So I'm not quite sure where you guys want to go then. Do you want to go with me asking for a mailing list per SDK, one global mailing list, not have a mailing list, just put names there? What do you guys want? I don't. I don't care. You, this is your guys' call. I have no strong preference either way. I mean, I already voted. I actually found. So we we were talking to a client, uh, and this was for Knative. The client because they're a publicly, they have like some government regulation and they were, they can't talk to us using Slack because it's a too free form of a media and it, it's not audited. So the only way they can interact with us is through email. <laughs> That's hilarious. So I thought that was interesting. And if so, if, if there's another uh, entity that needs to interact with the SDK authors in that way, a mailing list that's directly for them pr probably makes sense. So it seems to me, though, that the amount of traffic we have right now is relatively small, even for something as popular as the Go SDK. Um, so I, that's why that's another reason why I'm a little nervous about one million less per SDK. 
what if we can we start with one mailing list for all SDKs, and then if one particular if one particular one gets busy, we can look to fork it to its own? Yeah, that's that's what I said. Yeah, that sounds fine. Anybody object to that? Fine. Okay. I I can look into that. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you, Vlad. All right. Um, all right. So last one. Oh, I already have it here. Forgot. So what do you guys think about this? Uh, it's just high level information for people looking to write an SDK. I don't know what a release candidate means in this context. You might have to elaborate a little bit. I struggled with that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll work on the wording of that. But does everything else seem okay? I mean, it's not normative or anything. It's just sort of high level guidance. So does that what does that mean that um, with major release we only have one major release, which means we can go and drop all the support for all the previous preview versions, right? I would assume so, but what do you? Guys, this is up to you guys. I mean, it looks like if the Go SDK drops it, then I can um, then I will probably go and go and drop all those versions as well because um, I mean that that that's going to be making things much quicker. So I, I like this. It, yes. it, it gives clarity. Scott, did you drop all previous or just no, no. one or two? We're keeping dot three. Okay. So dot three and uh, the reason is dot three is very similar, not exactly the same, but similar to one o. Yeah. One is very divergent. So removing that removed a bunch of like special casing. Yeah. Yeah, we we have so so uh, for C sharp since we. That's our home language at Microsoft, so to speak. And we have, um, so lots of our customers are using it. And we have had customers who have been um, using cloud events with uh, uh, event grid where we supported zero one in the product. And we didn't support anything in between, but then we support support one oh. Um, I have to think about what, what the repercussions of cutting it are. But um, yeah, customers should move on. Okay, so it sounds like you guys are okay with this in general. I'll just work on the yeah, wording of a release candidate. Yeah, uh, because this is this is this is effectively you know this is what we commit to, not necessarily what the code does. All right. For a, for a new SDK, like let's say you well, I have so it was like for example, Rust is coming online. Uh, mm -hmm. Should we require that they also support dot uh, zero dot three? Uh, uh, Scott, uh, for this I can say that. I want to support uh, the dot three for the really simple reason that we need to understand how to abstract uh, the various specification versions. So we will have support for point three only for this reason. I agree with that. I, I think things like the JavaScript SDK don't do quite the the same level of introspection of the event, and I think you have to say like I think this is a version two event. Go, and it tries. Scott, are you suggesting that we actually special case 0 0.3 in, in this list, or no, it's no, a no, nice no. to have, but we shouldn't no. require it? No, no. Okay. No, I, oh, sorry. Um, it is good hygiene to be able to write your code in a way that handles multiple versions. Right, but I, I was more interested in in whether it's okay that the Rust SDK not support 0 0.3. Ideally, the the muscle that you develop by supporting n minus one is very valuable for the n plus one. It's more work. But it's I, very valuable. Uh, yes, but you're 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 speaking abstractly, uh, and I agree with you. But concretely, do we want to say zero point three is a special case, and because n minus one doesn't exist, we're going to say you should support zero point three as long as n equals one point zero. I, yeah, maybe I think you should sh remove that word major and just say releases. Well, the problem was I, at that point, well, what is a release, right? Is it 1.1 versus 1.0? I don't think so. Mm. Right, that's why I phrase it that way. And I, I'm, I have no problem adding a bullet here that says, oh, and by the way, for the case where n is 1.0, n minus 1 means 0 0.3. I'm okay with that, if that's what you guys want. 
what if we call the zero releases major? <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about this just because it's technically anything before 1.0 should be completely optional, toss away, whatever you want to call it, right? It, it's, it's not until you get to 1.0, things actually matter. Um, yeah, we, possibly. Okay, here, how about this? We, you keep these words and you say um, it's, it's recommended that you also support um, at least two versions. Uh, okay, I, th I can think I can work with that. No, no, no. that. Today, that implies that you have uh, zero dot three support, and in the future, it it might not. It, what, what do people think of that? Well, well, well mm, see, what's interesting is you phrased it nicely, abstractly. That that's good, and but realistically, we already say that here, right? And the only reason that you actually need that other sentence that you just said is because of the 1.0 situation. So it may be better from an understanding perspective to not be coy about it and just say, look, 1.0 is a special case. It is highly recommended that you also support 0 0.3. Yeah, sure, as a footnote or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, that's, that's fine. Okay, Would anybody, anybody else have a problem with that? Okay, hold on. Maybe like an asterisk on major releases and then like, by the way, 1.0 doesn't have any more, doesn't have an N minus one release. So we're yep. going to consider the 0 0.3 a major. Yep. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I'll work on that and then let you guys review it. All right, thank you. Let's go over here. Whoops. Okay, anything else you guys want to talk about? I've have you seen the conformance tools status? No, I was actually, I did add that to here. Let me go. Can you, uh, yeah. can you stop sharing? Yeah, oh, even better. Where is it? Stop sharing, go for it. Okay. Uh, this one, maybe? Oh boy, here we go, hold on. Uh -oh. Ah, I picked the right one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I made a thing, it's called Cloud Events. You can install it. Um, there's instructions. The The idea is that you could have this like canned set of YAML that's encoded as the event and then send it out to some target, which is pretty interesting. But it, it also has a mode where you can say cloud events, uh, listen, which, oh, here, hold on. I got it. Boop. So I can say cloud events listen, and then I can say cloud events uh, send, and we'll get the help for that. So we need we need a couple here. Uh, well, we need a couple things. So ah, here, some nice person gave you an example. Connect oh, because some idiot made a typo. So now I can send with cloud events and then over here, the cloud events uh, conformance tool is also listening. And it doesn't do any like major data processing. It just dumps stuff out. And as you can see, it, it doesn't do it exactly right. And then maybe there's some bugs in here because it's very, very little code. You can also, um, the thing that's interesting is that this is a stream of YAML. It's written to, um, to the standard out this is written to standard error. So you can pipe this, uh, the output of listen to a file and then have a stream of events that it'll try to send for you in the next round uh, if, you, if you so choose. So you can do cloud, uh, cloud events invoke. And invoke takes a target and a file and it'll the file can be a directory and you can recurse that directory structure in case you want to do that. So that's the current state of the, this little cloud events tool and it's, I think it's pretty helpful. I find myself using it a lot when I want to validate that what I'm doing is kosher. That, that, that looks really cool. I'm just trying to piece it together. Um... Oh, sorry, here, I'll go back. What's oh, your... Yeah. So 
where does the conformance side of this come into play? Do you see this as being, uh, well, yeah, how, how do you see this being part of the conformance right. work that we talked about? So the, the conformance thought was that you could, you produce this file that you listen on, and then you compare that to what you sent. And if those two things are the same, like by a diff, then uh, you you are sending what you are receiving, or you're you're receiving what you're sending. At least you think you are. Okay, that helps. Thank you. All right. So the the thought was that this is a double ended thing, and it, it would go, um, you know, it it invoke. And then some black box you're testing. And then the black box is supposed to send another HTTP uh, request to this listen. And so uh, invoke is taking in YAML, some set of YAML, and then listen produces some YAML. And at the end of the test, you can compare what the invoke YAML looked like and what the listen YAML got. And so I, I need to write a tool that helps you do that diff and see if it passed because there's some extra garbage that it sticks in here for you. Mm -hmm. um, actually, those are transport extensions. Ah. So you can ignore those if you need to because it's not part of the cloud event. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds cool. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions or comments for Scott? Scott, can we, can we create a, a full-fledged TCK from this? Because that's something that I would love to have for, for the Rust SDK. Because now we're starting, so... To get well, I mean, it's, it's a command line tool, so you can interact with it. Yeah, what I mean is that at some... Do you feel at some point we could provide uh, scripts or ready-made oh, yeah, yes, uh, yeah. ready YAM output YAMLs, so... Right, so uh, let's see. I, I was attempting to do this um, conformance. So in the conformance tool, I have a, a canned YAML directory. And so like if you go into uh, V1, zero, you s I, I mean, <laughs> so I kind of cheaped out, but you see what the, the minimum version of what I think a valid cloud event would look like at the minimum level. This is like testing that emojis work and all this stuff. And so you can actually, actually we'll, we'll try it now. Um, cloud events invoke HTTP 8080 um, and then minus F this file. And so it goes and reads that file, interprets it back into an object. It's very simple code. There's not a lot of logic here. And then the listen tool dumps out what it got. And so, you know, there's a couple things. Looks like it's not actually doing. This should be a, actually, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> the conformance tool is not conformant? No, it's fine. It's, this is, <laughs> it, it, it tries its best. It, it, it yeah, probably yeah, needs some I love. Get it. I wrote it in like a weekend. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. But the idea was that like, you have this set of conical JSON or conical YAML that you write, but it also helps you produce it. And then it helps you send it as a blob, but you can also like poke at things that are running. And so like, as I'm testing with, uh, it's actually really useful for the, the changes for the Go SDK, because I know that this is an alternate implementation that mostly works. Mm, I'm wondering that if, if the receiver is able to validate the events, and maybe echo, echo them back. Well, that, that assumes that the, the black box you're testing um, has the ability to respond. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to make that assumption because you no, know, a, a real test would be this uh, invoke to HTTP. So here's HTTP. Uh, and then this is like some receive adapter that goes to AMQP that goes to some subscriber that goes to uh, send this listen thing. And then this results in YAML. All right, so the, the black box here, um, this black box, 
would be the harness that you you set up, or sorry, uh, this is the black box. That this tool helps you um, use. And then you can stub out whatever you need in, in between the testing piece to be able to compare the, the input that invoke used and listen and what the listen command got. But anyway, I'm sure there's more to do here. Um, it, and, and it's, it's very simple, simple code. And I think I don't even support, I think I support like one and three point three. But you can check it out. It's um, it's the cloud events slash conformance repo is where the tool is. Yep. Right. I was going to ask you about the status of that. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you, Scott. Any other topics for today's agenda? Okay. So I'm assuming we're going to go back and meet in two weeks, right? Not next week. Does that sound right? Not hearing any objection. If something does pop up and you guys really want to have a phone call, you know, next week, let me know. But otherwise, I'll assume we'll, we'll meet again in two weeks. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll talk again next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.